Sometimes the breath is like a wild animal. If you stare straight at it, it runs away. You have to look out of, out of the corner of your eye. In other words, sometimes when we try to tackle the breath, that's the problem. We're trying to tackle it as we relate to the breath energies in the body, the ones that we're using to create changes in other parts of the body may actually be the uncomfortable breath energies, the ones that are tight, the ones that are stiff. And of course, you use stiffness in order to spread some ease to the body, it's just going to all get stiff. This is why in some cases it's good to start the meditation reflecting on something that puts the mind at ease, some Dharma theme that might be goodwill, thinking of the Buddha, thinking of generosity. And as you let your mind relax around that thought, notice what the body does. There will be a change in the energy. That good change in the energy is good breath energy. And just let it bathe the body. In the beginning, don't be too much in control of where it's going to go or how it's going to go. Just see if you can allow it, have that attitude of allowing, allowing, allowing the energy to come. Just place one thought in the mind, which is that whatever energy is going to be good for the body, allow it to come. Allow the body to do its own thing. And see if you get a different sense of what it means to have good breath energy in the body. And then you can take that as your touchstone the next time you meditate. I know that when I was first meditating with the breath and reading about the different breath energies, this was my problem. As soon as I thought of focusing on the breath, it was like I had a stranglehold on it. The whole body tensed up. In other words, only when I was doing things where I wasn't specifically trying to meditate, where it just happened that I happened to be with the breath, I began to notice, oh, okay, there are these comfortable energies there. In one case that happened on a bus in Bangkok. I'd been listening to a John Fung talking about catching the breath. And I'd been trying to catch it and realize I was tensing up my shoulders, tensing up my arms to catch the breath. So if I just allowed those parts of the body to relax, the breath energy was perfectly fine. But being an American, I went back and I complained to him about, why did he use the word catch? He laughed and he said, it just means to stick with it. As in Thai when they say jap da, which means it literally means to catch with your eyes. You keep your eye on something. So you keep your gaze on the breath, but you don't have to catch it, you don't have to mold it, you don't have to push it around. Just stick with it and see when you have comfortable energies, notice what they're like. When they're uncomfortable energies, notice what they're like. And then try to develop an attitude of allowing the comfortable ones. That's how they stay comfortable. And this way you can get back into your body in a comfortable way. So that does feel like home, that does feel like shelter. We're trying to create a shelter here for the mind, a place where it can be safe. Where when the winds blow through or the rain falls, you've got your safe place to be. Both in terms of difficult issues coming in from outside and difficult stuff coming up from inside. You need to have a part of your awareness that's not involved in anything. And if you get the breath as your ally, that makes it even better. Because you have your safe place to stay. In Thailand, some of the John Fung students will talk about having, their, having an air-conditioned room. When things get hot outside, they can stay in their air-conditioned room. Of course, here sometimes it's cold outside, you have your warm room. But whatever every way, it's the comfortable room, the comfortable space inside that gives the mind some stability, gives a sense of grounding. 
so we can see things more clearly. Step back from what's bubbling up from within, all those asavas and floods that can come flooding the mind if you're not careful. This is why the Buddha used the image of the island, the island above the flood. Sensual desire comes bubbling up. Your views come bubbling up. States of becoming come bubbling up. Ignorance bubbles up. These are like springs of water that, if you're not careful, they can start turning into gushers, and then they can be whole rivers and floods. And sometimes you can nip them in the bud, and other times, by the time you've realized they've happened, they're already pretty large. But if you have a safe place to go, at least you can step out of them so they don't carry you along. With the realization that whatever comes up in the mind, a lot of it has to do with past karma. And so it doesn't mean that there's something going on in the mind right now. It's your involvement with these things that turns into present karma. So you can decide. You have the choice. You have the right to say, no, I'm not going to go with that anymore. Because otherwise these flies just run around in circles. They turn into whirlpools. As a teaching, it's not in the canon, it's in the commentary, but it's a useful one. The cycle of action, the cycle of results of action, and the cycle of defilement. These three things feed one another. If you're acting under the power of a defilement, it's going to create bad results, and then you're going to not like those results. And if you're not careful, that unpleasant state is just going to come around and turn into another defilement. And you keep spinning around and around and around. You know what happens with whirlpools? They suck you down. What you want to be able to do is step out of the cycle. At the very least, learn how to develop a resistance to the results of actions, so you don't feel like you're being right in the line of fire. They come, but they go past you. Or in that image of the person sitting in the back of a station wagon, the old kind of station wagon where the back seat faced backwards. You're riding down the road, and as soon as you're aware of something, it's already going away and going away, rather than coming at you. And if you have that attitude toward pains and other unpleasant things that come up, you can deal with them a lot more effectively. You're not feeling threatened. You're not in the line of fire. As the Buddha said, your duty with regard to any kind of pain any kind of suffering is to comprehend it. And you're in a much better position to comprehend it when you're not feeling threatened by it. So learn how to perceive it as something that's going away, going away. You've seen it and it's disappearing. You see it and it's disappearing. Now it may come back again and again, but again, each time it comes back, it's going to disappear. This so way you've got your safe place, you've got your safe perceptions. You're turning all five of your aggregates into a shelter. The sense of the body feels secure, if not the whole body, at least the aspects of breath energy that are soothing. When you need to be soothed, energized, when you need to be energized. The feelings of pleasure that come from that, the perceptions you hold that help you sidestep things that are coming up. And your understanding about karma, in other words, the karma of the mind is such that Things arise through the power of old actions. And the way you attend to them is going to determine whether you create new karma around it. But you've got that choice. You can step out of that cycle of action and result and defilement, cutting it at the connection between the, the result and the defilement, or failing that. At least if there's defilement in the mind, don't act on it. And don't feel like you're getting bottled up with these things. Breathe through it. Allow the comfortable breath energy to ease through these things and dissolve them away. And you've got that sense of awareness, the, the observer. That's your consciousness. Combined with the, 
the fabrications that help you understand these things. You've got all five aggregates working as a shelter. Because they, too, are actions. We, have, we are owners of our actions, heirs to our actions. So try to do your actions well. Meditation is a kind of karma. It's learning how to be skillful in how you relate to your actions. You relate to past karma, relate to present karma. But you can use your actions to make a shelter, something you can depend on. Even when other things are going really wrong, you may have some bad karma coming up. And don't get embarrassed about the fact that bad karma is showing up in your life, things from the past. We all have things from the past. It's just that some people's bad karma shows now, other people's bad karma is going to show tomorrow or maybe next year. We each carry a field of karma seeds, and we can't see one another's karma seeds. All we see are the few that are sprouting right now. So don't look down on people who are having some bad karma seeds sprouting. And don't get proud of the fact that you've got some good seeds sprouting. You want to make good use of what you got rather than just sit around and enjoy the results of what you've done in the past. Anything bad's coming up? Think of yourself as a cook. A really good cook can take things that are even a little bit rotten and turn them into good food. So take your aggregates and even though someday you're going to have to let them go, in the meantime, turn them into something useful, a shelter for you, a safe place in the mind. It may be a little rickety, but work on it. And you find that the sense of shelter will get stronger and stronger. <laughs>